Here we go, folks. Another episode of Positively Trek with your hosts, Dan Gunther and Barry DeFord. Barry, are you ready to talk some Trek this week? I am so ready. I was born ready, in fact. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, yeah, we're, we're going to get right into it this week. We have a fun discussion. It's going to be our our favorite Star Trek controversial or unpopular opinions. I'm not sure how I'm going to end up titling this, depending on if we're more controversial or more unpopular or some mix of the two, but... I think that's going to be a fun discussion. You know those opinions. Everybody has a few of them. Uh, we're going to definitely share a bunch of ours. <laughs> I hope it's I hope it's also a chance to meet people where they are, too. And in, in, in these mm-hmm. kinds of discussions, I think oftentimes one can get the gatekeeper notion or like the super yeah. nerd notion, all that sort of stuff. But I really do think that this is this is the for me, the meat of, of Star Trek is it's an imperfect thing, right? And, and in mm-hmm. that respect, we can look at it from imperfect angles and make imperfect judgments on things. And and <laughs> in that, I think you find the the love of the of the entire franchise itself, right? Absolutely. And, and yeah, when I say opinion also, I want to really emphasize my definition of opinion, which is it's not something that I believe to be a fact, A fact and an opinion are two very different things. So if my opinion differs from someone else's, I will never, ever be upset, you know, as long as it's about things to do with Star Trek or other very low impact, fairly inconsequential things like that. Right. So, you know, if you absolutely love Star Trek V, The Final Frontier and think it is the uh, an amazing work of art, I don't agree, but all power to you. <laughs> it's very low hanging fruit, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm get, not getting into the uh, controversial ones yet. That was three pretty... people were like, hey, <laughs> right. <laughs> I would be shocked if three people. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, one of them dropped their food or something. I better. <laughs> I was going to say, and one of the other ones is William Shatner. So there you go. Yeah, I hope he, I don't, I, unpopular opinion. I hope he's not listening. <laughs> I hope not too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, before we get to that though, we do have some news stories and I find myself in the uh, position here of having to reiterate, of course, that while this is positively Trek, Uh, We do have some bad news to share, which is never fun. Uh, Those of you who follow my YouTube channel know I already kind of made a video, a mini rant about this uh, earlier last week. But the breaking news, of course, is that Star Trek Mission Seattle convention has been canceled. Uh, Reed Pop's second official Star Trek convention, this would have been, uh, but it is no longer a go. So... I personally am really disappointed about this. I was actually planning on going. Uh, Seattle's a beautiful city. I was really excited to take Nikki and show her this wonderful place that I've been to a few times before and uh, go to a Star Trek convention as a bonus. I mean, how cool would that be? But unfortunately, um, originally scheduled for May 26th to 28th, it is no longer happening. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I saw that in the discourse there and... I don't know. I feel <clears throat> like with just like where I'm working and stuff right now, there's a lot of really sick people. And like, I am a little bit like this does does assuage some of maybe the um, feeling some people have who, who are still, you know, really trying to avoid infection from COVID or from a number of other sort of complicating viruses from uh, if you've had it more than once and whatnot. So I don't know necessarily if COVID is the reason why they're stopping it. Uh, did you hear of any reason that they were talking about that it may be getting shut down? Well, that's kind of the thing is they they haven't really given much of a reason. The, uh, the whole thing broke when Alex Perry, another Star Trek podcaster, got a message back from somebody there saying that it was canceled And there had been no official anything about that. And then about two days later, I think because he kind of let this out, they had to finally make this official statement. And all the statement says is, and I'm quoting here, after careful consideration, the decision has been made to not move forward with the Star Trek Mission Seattle event in 2023. We are working on new ways to bring our favorite Trek fans the optimum experience. And we look forward to celebrating together again in the future. And with this image that said, read this full post for more information. And that's the full post. So that's it. (laughs) I guess like 
there is always this like, do they know something we don't? Like, what then is the reasoning? And yeah, that's um, mighty cryptic. Mm hmm. And the other part of this equation, too, is the fact that the destination Star Trek conventions in uh, Europe are kind of done now, it sounds like, and and closed. And it kind of got out that that was a decision made by Paramount, not necessarily the company that puts them on. So I'm wondering, and this is way out on a limb, big time speculation here, is this Reed Pop or is this Paramount? Yeah, it's hard to say what exactly or who exactly is at the helm of these decision makings and, you know, what exactly they're hoping to either accomplish or avoid, right? Like, is it a purely financial decision and we're just not privy to the bean counters calculations, I guess? Or or is there, yeah, like you say, maybe a wider reason that uh, we're just, again, not, just not privy to? Well, there. I mean, you think about potential legal liabilities under COVID and the different restrictions that one has to adhere to. Maybe it is just that sense that um, in a post- covid world where infection from infectious diseases is now just sort of like name of the game um, i bet you that changes certain liabilities and it could even make something like a convention unprofitable and obviously if something's unprofitable then it dies yeah so you know the, and, and I, I mean they wouldn't want to say that like we don't make enough money off you nerds so we're shutting this crap down <laughs> like i don't know right yeah but it makes me wonder absolutely well and also the other elephant in the room i guess of course is star trek las vegas and they you know creation previously had the license and it was given to read pop and uh now creation they just sent out an email today uh that i'm looking at on my phone right now and the subject line is stlv still the one and now only major convention in the world so they're really jumping on this and uh <laughs> the body of the email is uh Throw in a bit of shade in Reed Pop's direction, I think. Yeah, I, I kind of got that impression as well, just, just sort of from how this is all panned out, where Vegas is like, well, we're brave enough. But I mean, like, I guess like they can have day after day shows of Celine Dion, and, and apparently that's profitable. So I mean, if you're going to do something like that, I think Vegas is the place to do it, because it's it's just so geared towards banquets and conventions and people, you know, doing all of that stuff right maybe maybe that's the case like maybe maybe vegas atlantic city and like macau can be like the new <laughs> the new star trek haunts just because they're good for like gambling and, and other sorts of things like that right so what else is going on in the world of the news i hear um we've got some stuff on the outline that i'm not scrolled to hold on a second <laughs> oh yeah prodigy season one is coming to blu-ray yeah. pretty soon I'm excited for that because I do have to say, like, despite streaming services ubiquity and how easy it is to get, having a hard copy is good when I'm having internet troubles as we record. And it would be nice to be able to watch a show, say, when the internet goes out. And what better choice than Star Trek Prodigy? 100%. I'm right there with you. Star Trek is pretty much the one exception I made. I make for having an actual physical copy of media. And so I'm sure I'll be picking this up. It's uh, they they are releasing it in two parts. It looks like, so we've got, we've got prodigy season one, volume one. So it'd be like the first 10 episodes of the season with the, the second set coming at some later date. But yeah, this uh, these first 10 episodes, it looks like they're going to be arriving on January 3rd, 2023. So just right after the new year, uh, you'll be able to pick that up on DVD or Blu-ray. Very cool. And and again, it's a, uh, I've watched a, a number, a, a couple more episodes and I'm very happy with it. So oh, excellent. I, I'm, I'm seriously considering getting this. Yeah. I, I have to say. I'm definitely like I said, going to pick it up for sure. And I'm, I'm glad you've watched more. I'm excited to hear what you think as, as the series goes on, because there've been some really interesting episodes recently for sure. So we should do some kind of like prodigy retrospective soon. That would be kind of neat. Definitely. I think after, uh, after season one wraps, uh, which would actually be right at the end of the year, I believe. Uh, yeah, we should do that and just kind of, yeah. uh, recap the season. Well, uh, one final bit of Star Trek news, which just hit uh, today as we're recording this. This is uh, the Monday that we're recording. Production has officially wrapped on Star Trek Discovery Season 5. 
So the latest season of Discovery, they've wrapped production. Still lots of post-production to be done, of course. But principal filming has been wrapped on the show. So looking forward to that. It's a seriously dynamic studio environment. I've, I've seen those like tours and stuff like that. And I would love to, to go on to the Discovery set. It seems like a very sort of happy and uh, you know, collegiate kind of place and stuff like that. So, you know, to think that we are approaching seven full seasons of a Star Trek series again is really cool. I'm mm-hmm. really happy about that. And I, and honestly, I hope they do seven and stop. I really do. I know there's a potential that they could do eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 18, um, you know, Doctor Who it if they want, I guess. Right. <laughs> and I would actually say like the, the, that quantum warpy kind of mycelial network actually has some reminiscence to, to some Doctor Who kind of stuff, but I hope they stop. I, and I, and I mean that maybe this is a, one of our unpopular opinions, but like, I hope after seven, they tie it up real nicely and it ends satisfyingly and, and good, you know, like, like, like DS9 or something, you know? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to seeing where they go with it. But I would also appreciate like kind of a natural stopping point at some point. Yeah, season five, I, I looks to be a little different from what they've done in the past, which I'm really excited about. I The high stakes, the entire galaxy is going to be destroyed kind of thing is a little tired. Uh, so it seems like this season they're doing something more akin to like an adventure quest type story which uh, i'm definitely there for if uh it's anything like that teaser trailer we got looks like exactly and and i think that that kind of a tonal shift i would say and and again i'm delving into unpopular opinions but i think you know in terms of the concept of the tonal shift um discovery has that down and i i would like to see them tone down and have a bit more of a story driven you know character driven Something a little less high stakes would be nice. Absolutely. I think we're 100% agreed on that. (laughs) Well, on things that maybe we might possibly not be 100% agreed on, (laughs) I'm excited to get into our unpopular slash controversial opinions discussion. And we're going to do that right after this quick break. This episode of Positively Trek would not be possible without the support of those of you who have gone to patreon.com slash positively trek and signed up to become a Patreon supporter of the show. Thank you all so very much for your donations. They truly do help bring this show to you each week. Thank you especially to our Constitution class supporters, Joyce Marin, Justin Ozer, Jim Stoffel, Jesse Earle, Dave Garcia, Rick Young, and Paul D. Kinnear. If you'd like to become a supporter of the show, go to patreon.com slash positively trek. You can get perks such as early access to episodes, ad-free versions of episodes, exclusive content, shoutouts, associate producer credits, and much more. Once again, that's patreon.com slash positively trek. Thank you all once again. And now, let's get back to the show. So, controversial slash possibly unpopular opinions, we've all got them. Everybody has a few here and there that, you know, when you're in a big group of Star Trek fans, everyone seems to kind of have a consensus about one thing that you are on the outside of. And by you, I mean all of us, each and every one of us. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this. I think we've got some great ones here And Barry, you actually have a a good list kind of going in the show notes here. So I'm going to let you lead off with one of your unpopular opinions. Hmm. I'm trying to see if I want to go deep into it or if I want to just sort of go sort of maybe a little bit of low hanging fruit. Maybe I'll start that one. I think the animated series is entirely unwatchable. Um, (laughs) If, say, it was played at a friend's house and we were drinking and having a good time and talking and, you know, not really committing completely to the storyline of the animated series, I'd have fun. But otherwise, I'm far more compelled to do housework than I am to endure really almost any TAS episode. Now, again... If people are like, oh, I love it and stuff, I would challenge you in saying that you probably love it because you loved it when you were a kid. Um, (laughs) I never watched it as a kid. And the first time I watched it, I think I was 25. And I was like, what is happening? (laughs) It reminded me of like the old Hercules 
um, mm-hmm. movies where, you know, like you can just see the very lazy, shoddy animation, overused cells. They just flip images a lot. But I do find it remarkable that they managed to get like pretty much the entire cast to do it. Like there are some neat aspects to it, but as sort of like a museum piece, it's nice to sort of have there, but you don't really need to engage with it much unless like you have some kind of vested interest in it, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to, I mean, I, again, this, these are controversial and unpopular opinions. I'm going to not entirely agree with that one. So, uh, that's interesting. I like that. I, I also do know, and I'm not couching my opinion in, uh, carefulness because i know he's probably listening but aaron harvey is one of our uh, regular <laughs> listeners and i know he has thoughts now <laughs> hey love n- nothing but love but like yeah that's just where i'm at no i i hear you and there there are episodes of the animated series that i find very very difficult to watch uh, however, I would love to sit down with you sometime and watch, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but the episode yesteryear, I'd love to watch that with you and, and see what you thought. But Well, and, and that's the thing is by saying it's unwatchable, it doesn't mean that I watched the whole thing and made that determination. I think I've, <laughs> I think I've like sat through four, maybe five episodes, like how sharp is Serpent, a serpent's tooth. I watched just for, um, some backgrounders when I spoke with Bryson last on Polytrex about, mm-hmm. um, indigenous representation in Star Trek. But like outside of that, I've really not done much else. Like, I think I watched some at the, at the party we met at, um, right. I, that's probably the last time I watched, like really watched an episode. And I watched the other one where it's a, like the computer goes kind of haywire and calls Kirk a jerk. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And then I remember some purple cats, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. that'd, been, that'd be about it. I think uh, for me, the animated series does really well from a curated perspective. I think it's one of the ones that like, you know, you don't need to, I wouldn't recommend sampling everything on the plate. <laughs> I would say, try this one, try this one, try this one. And that's probably good. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like that old, like the box of chocolates at your grandparents' house. Exactly. You just don't want, you're like, you're really trying to avoid the one with that orange paste in the middle. You're like, oh God, if I get that one, this is going to be bad. Cause then you have to find a place to spit it out. Oh, unpopular opinion. That's my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The orange paste one is your favorite? Oh, I love orange and chocolate together. Yeah. Well, Ch- Terry's chocolate orange is an absolute work of art. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, no, the paste I can't. You know what the, the good part is, is if we're ever at a party, I'm really good at pointing them out. I'm like a, I don't know, I've got this weird like <laughs> orange paste chocolate radar that I'll be like, that's the one. Get it. Get it, down. Oh, I'll eat it. I will. <laughs> I will have that. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Well, yeah, I'm going to chime in with one that's, Uh, Kind of the flip side, more of a a, a positive note of something. Uh, The Deep Space Nine episode, Move Along Home, you know, where they sing a la Moraine and they go through that whole thing. I freaking love that episode. I've loved it since I was a kid. And it's probably one of the reasons I love it. Again, like you said, with the animated series, I watched it as a kid before I was on the internet and learned that we were all supposed to hate it. And uh, I really like that episode. (laughs) I remember the initial discourse I was chilling out with, uh, I was on the the Trek Geeks Facebook page and it came up and this is years ago, like this is 2016, a long time ago in internet years. And I remember even then people were like, come on, like, it's not like, it's not profit and lace, like, come on. (laughs) Yeah. And, and going back to it, I think that's the point is it gave the actors a chance to kind of lighten up doesn't really i mean it's early in this it's early in the series too Mm -hmm. so you know it is kind of still finding its legs and stuff like that but i don't know i think basing it off of getting stuck in a child's game is right up right up star trek's alley so if anyone doesn't like it it's like it's not like they're drawing from something terribly high concept here yeah it feels very tos to me which i I, i don't think that's why i really like it i think i just like it on a number of more basic levels than that but it it definitely does evoke that feeling and like as an adult and as somebody who's studied story structure and writing and that sort of thing i can see the weaknesses like i understand why it's not a particularly well-crafted story but i still just enjoy the heck out of it i love hearing 
Avery Brooks with his beautiful voice singing that ridiculous Alan Moraine song. And then Kira following him with that really annoyed voice, Alan Moraine, yeah. count to four. And she's just like not singing. I love it. I think every moment is, I just, I grin through the whole thing. I think the um, the gif that you see on social media when you use for that, like it's the one where you see Bashir come through and then he kind of <laughs> yes. does his little thing and just, and then, and then yeah, Kira drops in and does her like salute and then like flies off. You can even just see like Nana's like, good God. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think it's like, I like, I like move along home. I like watching the actors. Um, it, okay. So like I have this thing, another unpopular opinion. I love Gilmore girls, mm-hmm. but I have no interest in the storyline or any of the main characters. I watch Gilmore Girls just to look at the extras. It is hmm. it is so fun to people watch on Gilmore Girls. You just watch the extras. I, I've watched guys have like football passing games. I saw two girls pointed at a sprinkler for like like several things. I've seen the same guy get up and pick up the same backpack three or four times in a scene. <laughs> it's just, oh, Gilmore Girls is like, is a gourmet of just extras just doing whatever the hell <laughs> i love it anyways i like watching move along home also because i just noticed that it doesn't seem like the actors were enjoying themselves mm-hmm. <laughs> and and they were probably like oh my god they wrote this they wrote this thing on a legal pad in 20 minutes i bet you know <laughs> um, but it's like i don't know it's like watching a cat get a bath like there's something amusing about it yeah i definitely see that also the one thing i remember also is uh bashir is just so cringy in that episode And Cisco's just kind of redressing him the whole time. Um, I don't know. I still really enjoy it. I love it. Yeah. No, I think that's a good one. Well, moving on to other Deep Space Nine characters. See what I did there. Worf is a terrible father. Like, I just think (laughs) he's... And that's the thing is, like, it's not that I think it's something against Worf. Like, I just... I just think that Alexander was an extremely poorly written character who he never gets anything terribly interesting to do. Mm -hmm. I am going to absolutely 100% agree with you on this one. I I don't know how unpopular this opinion is, Um, maybe controversial, but I I see a lot online people commenting on Worf's parenting and it is really, really bad. In a in a franchise in which there are a lot of not great parents, I think Worf takes the crown as the absolute worst father. So I 100% agree with you. There are barely any decisions he makes that are the right decision when it comes to yeah, Alexander. Absolutely. So what, what do you got? Well, uh, I'm going to do another uh, thing that I really, really like. And I admit this unabashedly. I absolutely love this film from top to bottom so very much. I absolutely love Star Trek The Motion Picture. It is one of my favorite films. And there's the reason probably is, is that it was one of my first major introductions to Star Trek. I remember my mom bringing home like a rented VHS copy of it. And from that moment where they show like the Klingon ships going towards the cloud creature and you have that big swoopy camera move as the the Klingon ship passes below the camera and it swings up and you see the cloud. At that moment, I was basically looking at the screen going like, what is this? And I need more of it now. (laughs) Again, I'm not going to disagree with you, but I'm going to add a caveat. If you're going to watch Star Trek, the motion picture, and this is not something all of us are capable of, you need to see it in a theater, I would say, to really get the true appreciation. And the reason why I know this is because I've done this a few times now. I used to live um, in a bigger city that had many more theaters. And in that theater, they would sometimes show kind of classics, right? So like Goodfellas or Raging Bull or, you know, From Here to Eternity, even Metropolis, like some older stuff, like they had Buster Keaton things. And so it was a really good way to kind of get your your fix and watch these shows the way they were meant to be seen, right? And I think, you know, modern day televisions can sort of do it justice, but you also like, I mean, it was designed for a, for film, right? This was film. This is cinema. And I think that's what I would call the motion picture. It is cinema. It's not just a film. It's not just a movie you go see. This is 
eye candy, it's ear candy, it's, you know, done very much in that sort of space odyssey. There's there is a Kubrick and feel to it in the way it gives its visualizations. It it's a very immersive story. Yeah, they have like that overture at the beginning with just a blank screen and and you know yeah. a theme playing for like almost a full three minutes. <laughs> you're like, yeah. what is going on here? <laughs> yeah, people taking their seats, right? Like this is, you're you're not there to just watch a movie. You're there for an experience. Like I remember way back in the day, I think Red Letter Media mentioned something about good sci-fi is, you know, one of two things, right? It's, it's fast or it's slow, right? And he's like, in Star Trek, the motion picture is that way, right? You can start the movie and then like get lunch, go get a grease job on the car, um, this <laughs> Visit with a friend and come back and Kirk will have finally boarded the Enterprise, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you watch it for that. That mm-hmm. you you have you have to sit down. Like this is a this is movie is an investment. Like you can't casually watch that movie. No, absolutely. And it, it's funny you say that. Like I have never watched it on the big screen, but that feeling of being a kid and watching it, and I'm thinking back to the television we had, and it was significantly smaller and lower resolution than anything we have nowadays, like not even comparable. And I feel like I've seen it writ big, even though it was probably four by three, like it probably wasn't even letterboxed. Like I Mm. just remember just being like, wow. And just filled with awe about what was happening on the screen. And uh, everybody says, yeah, it's slow and it's the motionless picture is kind of the the dig that people make. But man, I just remember loving that so much. And, and every moment, like Spock floating into V'ger with the, the space suit and mind melding with it. I was just so into every moment in that movie. Well, and there's a lot of philosophical things as well about mm-hmm. all of that too, right? Like, I mean, I, I I can't even necessarily get into some of it, but like, it there there's some there's some connotations. There's you know the concept of life. There's the concept of like making life, right? Uh, Decker helps make life in the end, really, right? Uh, he he completes a circuit, um, and then like at the start, you you in certain shots you see his wang right through his <laughs> weird uniform. So like there's weird bits to that movie. There's, there's aspects and elements that I just have to say, like as unpopular opinions go, um, you're not going to really get any, any argument from me there. I think that, but you, yeah, I think you have to like the motion picture on its terms. <laughs> maybe, I mm-hmm. guess um, maybe, maybe kind of moving into sort of, similar territory of course we've we talked a little while ago about the scary moment in the transporter um in the motion picture and just how disturbing it was for me actually after seeing that scene that's really what piqued my interest into what the transporter was all about and then obviously there's been a couple of like scientists who've talked about it and everything else and i've pretty much drawn the conclusion in my mind that the transporter is a suicide box and i mean there's kind of two two fields of thought there that um what it does is it it meticulously takes you apart and it moves your particles at the speed of light to where those exact particles will then re-render yourself in the exact form that it came in so all you'd really feel is kind of fuzzy for a minute before you'd be getting reassembled somewhere else right Mm -hmm. and the other one is the transporter destroys you And it takes the entirety of your genetic code pattern, everything, and it puts it through a digital buffer where then it is broadcast to another place. And like a replicator does, it is able to replicate you perfectly in that place. And I would just say that if you think if you think of the idea that a person like Scotty's uh, pattern is put in and stuck, right, in, in, you know, forever or whatever, when it gets picked up by the Enterprise D, that's, that's a, that's just a faithful replica of what was Scotty sitting in a digitized pattern buffer that was slowly corroding and corrupting over time. So I would say in that respect, it's kind of like if you typed an essay, right, let's say you type an essay on the computer, and then you print that essay, are you holding the same essay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the second question is, does it matter? It's a, it's an interesting question. And, uh, I really like it because, you know, someone would argue or could argue that the transporter is the, the first way you described, right? Like it's not destroying anything. It's just taking your molecules and, and sending them physically to another place. 
But if that were the case, what is Thomas Riker made of then? I rest my case. Exactly. Or <laughs> what, how do the two Kirks in The Enemy Within work? Like, right? It's created something. <laughs> well, and that's, and then we can even get into the Tuvix paradox. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Where, where really, honestly, what should have happened is, is there should be some kind of backup pattern. So like if, you know, <laughs> whatever character gets, you know, sh you know, gets destroyed, like vaporized by a, a like a, a disruptor, right, or something, you can just be like, psych, and push a little button, and then they just get reformed, and then they just be like, oh, wow, you're like, basically everybody's Wayun. Um, <laughs> it would be sort of the implication there. Yeah. And, and it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, if they, if they opened that box, it would just be a, a too magic, right? It would be too easy to fix things, but you know, they created the transporter and it should be able to do that. You'd think based on other things we've seen it do. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean like what, you know, you get your arm blown off. It's like, well, it's made your arm how many times in the past and we have replicator technology can we not just do that? So is Chief O'Brien the worst mass <laughs> murderer in all of history then? <laughs> well, and that's the thing is, is I'm, I'm, I can't necessarily say because, you know, I think the biggest point is, you know, our, our inborn self, like what makes us who we are truly comes from within. And we, we see the, the death of a body as that inborn self, whatever spark that makes us who we are and in our individuality um, either ceases to exist or it um, reabsorbs itself into some kind of collective unconsciousness throughout the entirety of the universe or it it goes to some kind of afterlife um it is really dependent on the person right i would say that it lends itself most to sort of the atheistic notion of you know there is no soul um and though you personally may be made unconscious by this your entire consciousness itself your essence who you are what you are everything that makes you who you are can be just remade anywhere and so the the essay paradox comes to it right like if i rip that 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 physical essay to shreds i can just print another one i have the means you know but i mean obviously we're far more complicated than essays um i think i think futurama kind of looks into this idea as well of like you know what what's life and death and and those kinds of things um I like I like the exploration, like how how like you know Jordy and and um, I think uh, I forget and, and I think Ensign Rowe mm, um, right. were were you know out of phase and stuff like that, and so they could walk through walls and they pushed that poor Romulan into space, <laughs> and <laughs> that's where he is now. <laughs> just yep. just a cloaked phased Romulan floating through the void. Oh, that's dark. <laughs> so dark positive um <laughs> but i guess you know like they, they've really played with it and i i think that's the point is it's all pretend none of it's real don't worry about it we all can think what we want to think maybe there are little little transporter worms um and barclay's right you know like all those pieces all those things all done so that they could save money on the studio set back in desilu in the 60s <laughs> yep 100 percent Necessity is the mother of invention. Absolutely. Well, on that same sort of topic, we mentioned Thomas Riker. And one of my possibly controversial opinions is uh, the episode where he's introduced Second Chances in TNG. They absolutely should have killed off William Riker and had Thomas Riker become a, a regular cast member in a different role on on Star Trek The Next Generation from that point forward. I think that would have been so much fun, a really fun change. I feel like if the show were made today and it was less episodic and more serialized, that's absolutely what they would have done. And I think Jonathan Frakes would have had so much fun playing a different version of himself. Uh, honestly, that's a, that's a really good idea. That would have been really <laughs> cool. But you're right, if for episodic purposes, you know, if, you know, whatever station is just playing random Star Trek marathon episodes, that would be get a little weird if suddenly he's, you know, a completely different personality doing completely different things. But that would be really fascinating. Like, huh, 
Yeah, I think that would have been fun. And I and I think Jonathan Frakes would have had a ball with it too, you know? like Oh, Frakes would be into that for sure. Yeah, like watching that episode, you see how he plays the two of them differently and he's having fun with it, right? Like he's brash, he just kind of shoots from the hip and, and also he's been isolated for however many years, so he's not exactly the most socialized person anymore. I think that would have been great, you know, explore some of those psychological issues and you know, stepping in the shoes of yourself who's lived a completely different life. Yeah, that would have been great. Well, speaking of like extremely talented actors, one of my unpopular opinions is I find I like Discovery actually like the least among some of the Trek shows. And maybe it's because of all the high tax stuff. But I just I don't know. I found at times the gigantic tone shifts in the early season showrunner issues confusion kind of really made me feel hesitant about the, the, the show that I mean, I didn't really voice a lot of that hesitancy online because there was just so many people ready to hate Discovery. And I just felt I didn't want to add to that public discourse. Course, though like among people I knew personally I, I did sort of voice my doubts and I think my biggest frustration with Discovery is having that cast like if you just think about the names in that cast the talent right Sonequa Martin-Green leading that group I just felt like the writers weren't really living up to what their actors were going to be able to produce I, I sometimes felt like the actors it was like putting a Ferrari on a, on a town street and making it follow the speed limit in some ways. Right. And, and since then we've had a lot more exploration. We've seen a lot more risks being taken and, and I'll say it, it's been a happy ending for me. I definitely enjoy discovery a lot more now. Um, but I just really felt that was my biggest complaint was this amazing talented group of actors was being wildly un- underutilized in in what I was considering kind of the here you go storytelling. And I'm glad that in a lot of cases, the fans had a lot to say about that in a way that I think the writers listened. And that's why we're getting better seasons now. But yeah, I don't think I'll ever need to watch the first season of Discovery ever again. Yeah. That's fair Meh. enough. I, I have issues with uh, the first bit of Discovery as well. I, I feel like m- me personally, I'm pretty forgiving of a lot of it because, you know, it's the first Star Trek back after however many years. They're finding their their stride, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, there there are some big like left and right turns that just like, OK, I have a little bit of whiplash here. What's going on? Sorry, is that character Ash Tyler or Valk? I'm not sh- I'm still kind of not <laughs> really 100 percent sure how that all worked there. But yeah, uh, I, I mean, the fact that they had, they had Michelle Yeoh, right? And she's so incredible. Oh, man. Now I just I really want to see more of prime Giorgio and I'm so sad they killed her off in the second episode oh anyway okay who this isn't a discovery season one podcast (laughs) but but you're right yeah again an amazing talent and obviously bringing her back and getting her to be kind of sassy and all that stuff I you can tell Michelle Yeoh had fun with that Mm -hmm. but I felt like we didn't get um a mirror to the character we barely like we, we got a mirror to a character we barely knew yeah. so really i'm far more um engaged with um with with mirror Giorgio because she did just so much more yeah absolutely yeah and, and that's just like i wanted to see way more of the other version and we just never got it yeah yeah there were certain moments and again like you i kind of kept a little quiet about it you know, on social media and stuff, but there were moments that as longtime Star Trek fans, and I'm sure if, you know, everyone out there kind of searched your soul, you'd, you'd recognize this feeling a little bit where a character would say something or do something on screen. And you'd have that little like uh, moment where you're like, "Uh, well, maybe nobody noticed and you just move on, (laughs) you know, or like, ah, that doesn't really feel like it fits with okay no that's fine moving and i mean they were few and far between but they did happen and like you i love discovery now like i'm I'm much more uh enamored with the show now as it as it's gone on but uh, yeah there were those moments for sure (laughs) well another one i have is regarding the film star trek 3 the search for spock and this one tears me apart a little bit because this film has some of my absolute favorite moments in all of Star Trek in it. 
There are moments in that movie that I just are, are like my favorite moments in Star Trek, but that movie drops the ball in big ways so many times that give me those exact same like, ooh, I don't know about that feeling, which is hard to say because it's such a classic part of the original films and, you know, a big part of the, the trilogy that everybody speaks of. But for me, just as an example, the Genesis planet, when they say it ages and surges and they show like the, the sun really quickly setting. And I'm like, you're Star Trek. You need to be better than that. That's not how that works. Just because an orbit speeds up around a star that First of all, that would kill everybody. Second of all, that's not how time is made. That's just how we keep track of time. That's not science. Star Trek, you need to be better. <sighs> yeah, I'll buy that for Superman. For exactly. Whatever. Yes. But I'm not. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, I I like the search for Spock, and and I like it because of Christopher Lloyd's performance personally. Oh yes, I like, mean I love that too. <laughs> And I really just watch it for for that, and and you know you're still seeing the Star Trek actors, the original crew, still kind of in their prime. You know, even by the voyage home, you can tell they're getting a little like oh, okay, <laughs> kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I see what you're saying. There are some the need to bring Spock back was necessary, and I feel like yeah, they 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 ignored a fair bit of science to get him back, and a lot of magic took place. It's a very magical, very magical film. Yeah, in a, in a way that like. I don't know. I feel like 80s storytelling, there was a lot of that. Like my wife and I recently finished watching Quantum Leap and they would often do something in their stories that really bugged me. Like there'd be an episode about, you know, this character, this person that Sam has leapt into, is he actually a vampire? Like, oh no, of course he's not a vampire. Blah, blah, this is why. Al, this is science, blah, blah, blah. And then right before he leaps out, they like realize he can't see himself in the mirror or something. And they look at each other and it's like, <gasps> and then he leaps out and goes somewhere else. And it's like, oh, you just have to have that little stinger of like, ooh, the, it's, yeah. cr- it's creepy. No, come on. If commit to science or don't. <laughs> Fair enough. This is pedantic me. I I fully admit. I'm putting the Dan in pedantic right here. I get it. I'm being yeah, but I mean, ugh, you you got you got woo in my hard science fiction, which Star Trek really isn't, but that's another discussion. <laughs> well, I think I think I'm going to end my my list here on this one because it's it's somewhat um, apropos of what you've just said and and that is when we star trek folks start talking science and <laughs> um i hate the big bang theory like it is easily my least favorite show in recent memory though i have to say in a weird twist i find young sheldon charming in a wonder years sort of way um so i mean i am beset by my paradoxes um contain multitudes my friend (laughs) oh it's it's a strange thing but i find you know they're stalking for love they're they're sort of in out group behavior there's just a lot about them that you know they're they're quite reactionary they they create tropes for nerds and and so it's funny because like i think what it does is you know we've talked about conventions before and what conventions mean to us and, and how important they are and stuff but you know you ask any person who you know outside of the star trek world and they think a Star Trek convention is about a is just a bunch of Sheldon Coopers getting together and you know sort of ho- in in a in a hostile tone adjudicating one another's costumes right mm-hmm. um that's the last thing from it right like first of all i think that you know i think there's a lot of talk about him being um you know neurodivergent in one way shape or form um and maybe some people find that you know like you know i find i find meaning in that and i appreciate someone being represented that way but like i feel very much like the people i know in the star trek community who are actually neurodivergent um aren't like him at all Mm -hmm. um not not portrayed whatsoever like sheldon and in fact i find them to be um wonderful warm nurturing kind caring beautiful human beings who certainly in certain cases have to express what boundaries they have with you for their own personal feelings of safety and security and you honor those um and then everything's great and we're happy together and we have fun and we keep in touch when we're apart so i just think that you know in terms of what it does for caricaturing nerd culture um and for actually reinforcing some kind of 
weird masculine macho tropes through a nerd i just find the big bang theory to be insufferable for that yeah i uh i can't really disagree with you there's so many times i and i, I watched uh I, I don't think i watched the last however many seasons I, I don't even know how many seasons it went on but i did watch it at the beginning for a few seasons and yeah you had those moments where like you're kind of laughing at something and then you realize how insulting that is. <laughs> yeah. Like there's enough polarization in this world, I think, without having to polarize nerds versus non-nerds to an extent that they caricaturize them there. Like there's some heart to the show that I, I've recognized and stuff, but I did drift away from it because I just felt it wasn't, speaking to me and I didn't like the things that it was saying to the people it probably was speaking to, I guess. So again, if you like that show, I mean, whatever, cool. Um, I also, like I said, I'm very paradoxically fine with watching an episode here and there of young Sheldon for whatever reason. I find the grandma to be charming. You know, the funny part is, is the, the worst part about it is the theme music. Huh. <laughs> um, it's basically, he's talking about how tough and macho he is and how he could be your hero and stuff. And it's like, that's at no point is Sheldon ever trying to be anybody's hero. Um, <laughs> he, he's always just doing the thing he wants to do. Right. And so I, I find like, that's the only problem I have with the show is I'm like, the theme music is completely out of touch and somewhat tone deaf to the message of the TV show. But I like the interplay between Sheldon and his, his, uh, his siblings. Um, I find his older brother and, and twin sister to be extremely sympathetic characters. Um, I care about his mom. I think his dad is just, is he's, he's this stoic, caring kind of doughy dad who early on you find out he dies, but he continues living through season after season. So I don't know what to say. You know, it is that sort of sense of, of family you get from it. Um, it is very retrospective. Um, the ca the guy who plays him, whose name suddenly escapes me, uh, narrates it as well in a very kind of, um, kind of wonder yearsy sort of way I find. So yeah, I mean, it's a completely different shift. It's not a situation comedy in the sense it doesn't have a live studio audience or anything like that. It's, um, it's more story driven and I appreciate it. Very cool. Well, I'll definitely, uh, have to check it out at some point. Uh, so my last couple that I'm just going to do rapid fire, speaking of theme music, I find faith of the heart, very charming and I enjoy that song. And, uh, Apologies to everyone who doesn't. I get it. I was there at one point, but now I, I, I like it. I don't know. It's weird. And uh, I don't really give two rips about canon, particularly. I, <laughs> yeah, you know, man. whatever. If it's getting in the way of a good story, it's not worth uh, crying over. Well, um, we completely disagree. Faith of the Heart is, is something I just, I'll hit skip <laughs> through it. It doesn't. Rod Stewart's version from like way back is great. I, I mean, like there's so many good, like I love the Lower Decks um, theme music. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm very happy with it. Um, there's a bit of a Gustav Holst kind of Jupiter suite, I feel, that comes from it a bit. But, you know, there's there's been so many lovely overtures and, and orchestral music that comes from Star Trek that I did find the Enterprise thing was a little like, what? But whatever. I mean, that's the thing is like, that's why there's a skip function. We're totally fine. And if I was watching it, if I was watching it with you, I'd sing it along <laughs> life's too short life's too short to gatekeep something like that i yeah well if we watch two episodes on the next one i'd hit skip for you <laughs> and i I'd, I'd high five you for it so it's all good right well uh that, that was fun i think there's a lot of enjoyment to be had in some of these discussions and i'm sure there's way more out there that if the two of us were to plumb the depths we'd We'd come up with more, but I'd love to put it out there to the listeners. What are some of your favorite controversial or unpopular opinions about Star Trek? We'd love to hear from you about that. So uh, reach out to us, positivelytrek at gmail.com. You can email us, or of course you can find us on Facebook in the Positively Trek discussion group. And anywhere else online you find Positively Trek, I'm in the midst of setting up a Mastodon account for Positively Trek. So you'll soon be able to find us there as well. That will be the only reason I go on Mastodon. So perfect. <laughs> That's uh, I've been looking for a server and I will go on that server and 
that will be the group of people I will hang out with. And I'm excited for it because the my, the, the minuscule interactions I've had, and I apologize for that, everybody, I'm just not a social media guy in that respect. But if I have kind of more of a captivated section of internet space that I don't get distracted by other things, um, I feel like I engage a lot more. So maybe that's the secret. And I, and I would like to make a Mastodon account in that kind of vein. Awesome. Yeah, I've I've been playing around with it for a couple of days and I I'm getting a bit better at it. There's a bit of a learning curve, but I think I'm getting my my head around it a bit. Good. Well, that's good. I'm excited for that. Excellent. Well, you can also find Positively Trek, I should say, on Instagram. I don't usually shout that one out, but yeah, um Positively Trek on Instagram. We're there too. So, be there or be square. Absolutely. Well, you can find me online again in the Positively Trek discussion group, um, Instagram, Kurtrats47, and Twitter for about another week. And then I'm out. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can find me on Facebook. Um, I am a lurker on uh, Positively Trek. <laughs> and, um, and I'm on this show, and you can find me here. Don't look for me on Twitter, because I don't think Twitter's going to be a thing in its current form for much longer. And, uh, yeah, I think the writing's on the wall. And, uh, yeah, let's let's look at some other platforms and start looking at other options. I think that's a great idea. Well, thank you all so much for listening this week. We really do appreciate each and every one of you. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. So until then, as always, stay positive. Stay positive.